Hello and welcome to the inaugural episode of Owens Community College's EMS program's first podcast ever. I'm Matt Phillips and I'm the chair of the program and also a paramedic. I'm Daniel Kempel, I'm the medical director of the program and today we're going to be talking about airway. So we're going to go over anatomy, physiology, adjuncts, talk about tips and tricks that we've learned, things we know over the time in our years. And then we're also going to go over some articles uh, regarding airway and EMS and kind of where the field is headed. All right, great. Let's start with the upper airway. In the upper airway, we have our nasopharynx, right? Part of that is your tonsils. The tonsils is actually part of the defense system in your body because as the germs come in your nose and mouth, it activates the immune system very quickly to start fighting off that. Your uvula is that dangly little thing that moves with a soft palate. Um, and it helps close off the nasopharynx to prevent food from entering the nasal cavity. Oropharynx, you have your tongue. Remember, that's a, a huge muscle, and when it relaxes, it can block off the airway, so that's why we got to make sure we block it off so that we have a straight shot down to the trachea. Uh, your laryngeopharynx and your hypopharynx, sorry about that, um, is your molecula. And that's where your MAC blade seats um, during intubation. Your vocal cords, um, it's kind of a, the, the twin whitish looking folds of mucous membranes. Moving further down, you have your larynx. Um, it's where your esophagus and your trachea is. Something interesting about the trachea, it's part of the upper airway and your lower airway. All right, moving down to the lower airway, let's look at your trachea. Uh, don't forget part of the trachea is the hard cartilage rings inside of the trachea, which actually helps it keep from flattening out during uh, inspiration. Um, it's also the point where when you slide your bougie in, the bougie bounces off the tracheal rings and you have a tactile stimulation so you know when you're in the trachea. Your bronchi is a large bore air passage that lead from your trachea to your lungs. Avioli, um, they're the balloons where all the gas exchange take place. And your pleura is a membrane that envelops the entire lungs. All right, so now that you guys had a quick review of the anatomy, let's talk about the physiology. So the first thing is knowing the difference between respiration and ventilation. Both those are very important. Respiration is defined by the exchange of gases between a living organism and its environment. We have two types of respiration. We have aerobic and anaerobic. Aerobic means using oxygen, anaerobic means without oxygen. So what we do is we exchange oxygen and carbon dioxide on our red blood cells in the tissue. So this is where red blood cells are dropping oxygen off and they're picking up carbon dioxide, which is used uh, metabolites from the cells. And then that CO2 is brought to the lungs and it, the reverse happens. The lungs off gas the CO2 and take on fresh oxygen. The body decides how much respiration, how fast the breaths are, how deep your breaths are, First choice is based off carbon dioxide, which is also an acid, so it helps the body maintain acid-base status as well. The second choice, if carbon dioxide is chronically high, like our COPD ears, then it will use oxygen demand. This is why you may have been told in the past you don't want to do high-flow oxygen on COPD ears too long without supporting their breathing. Now we have CPAP, so that's really helped reduce the incidence of decreasing hypoxic drive. So what are some causes of increased carbon dioxide production? fever, sepsis, muscle exertion from shivering or from exercise, and then also we have metabolic issues, diabetic ketoacidosis, overdoses, those kinds of things. Um, causes of decreased carbon dioxide elimination will be respiratory depression, so our opiate overdoses, our benzo overdoses, head injuries, hemorrhagic strokes, airway obstruction, um, any sort of impairment of respiratory muscles, so whether that's polio, which we still see a little bit of these days, muscular dystrophy, those kinds of things, or obstruction due to physiology. And this is what you're going to see most often is people with COPD, people with asthma, people with cystic fibrosis, they have chronic lung problems where they have trouble getting um, air to move and off-gassing. So ventilation is defined as a mechanical process that moves air in and out of the lungs. We have inspiration, which we do by creating a negative pressure in the chest. What I mean by that is we're using our muscles to physically expand the chest cavity. When we do that, we're creating almost a negative space inside the chest, a negative pressure. So we're making the size of the tank larger. And what that does is that decreases the pressure of the volume inside the tank, which allows volume from outside to come in. 
So that's how we do an inspiration. Expiration is actually mostly passive. What it is is the lungs are recoiling, kind of like a balloon that you blow up and then you let go of the, the opening. It'll deflate on its own. That's actually a majority of how we expire. However, we do have other options. We can use our, our accessory muscles and our breathing muscles for this as well. Uh, and pursed lip breathing is kind of a way to notice how we alter our expiration in order to achieve physiological status. What we're doing is we're actually creating an increased pressure in those airways by pursed lip breathing. We're not letting all that pressure out at once. And we're trying to hold the airways open, which is effectively the same thing that we do with CPAP. Additionally, um, we will increase ventilation uh, to facilitate increased respiration. So like I said, CO2 is a primary driver of ventilation and respiration. CPAP and BiPAP, what we're doing in CPAP is we're trying to create end positive airway pressure. So CPAP and BiPAP are very similar. BiPAP is CPAP plus inspiration help. So what we mean by that is with BiPAP, we get extra pressure on the inhale. That's called your inspiratory positive airway pressure. Then you also get the CPAP, continue, continuous positive airway pressure, or the extra pressure on the exhale to help hold those bronchioles and tubes open to allow the off-gassing to happen. People who have COPD have lots of secretions, lots of uh, junk in their lungs. They have bronchospasm. So we need to keep those bronchi, the small airways open as much as possible to allow the gas time to move back and forth. Um, so that's basically it for me. All right, great. Let's go over a little more about some airway adjuncts. And let's keep in mind that we've got all these great tools and we'll be paramedics. Um, so we want to go right to the advanced stuff. But let's remember there is no substitute for good BLS skills. And doing that, how do we position a patient for great airway flow? Right? We always used to do the head tilt, chin lift. And there's a lot of articles out there now that are saying that that may not be the best position for our patients. There's an article in Gems that is called A Modern Approach to a Basic Airway Management, and it shows that the jaw thrust is the most effective way to do it. And the worst position for a patient to be that's in respiratory distress is supine. Okay, let's talk about pre-innovation. We have different um, positions we can put our patients. The sniffing, a ramped, and a neutral position. A sniffing position, we've all seen people do that. They align their airway so they can breathe better. If they can't do it themselves, we can put pillows under their head to align the airway. Um, for most adults, we want to line up the sternal notch and the ear. That creates the best pathway and the easiest way for air to flow in. Uh, ramped position for obese adults, um, elevate the shoulders, get them in that position that makes it easier for them to breathe. In neutral, we, we always talk about pediatric patients. They have big, huge heads. We got to make sure that they're in line too. You might want to pat underneath the shoulders. Um, your nasal airway, we have our nasal trumpets. Um, a good friend of mine and flight physician that I flew with for many years is Dr. Ron DiCecco, and he always advocated two nasal trumpets, and you can push so much oxygen through that. Um, a nasal trumpet works great for when somebody has a gag reflex also. Um, you're going down, you're looking at oral pharyngeals now, and when you put those in, the purpose of them, one, is a bite block, two, it pulls the tongue out of the way so that you have a clear airway passage. Um, but the problem with that is if they have a gag reflex, they're going to bite down on it. Um, bag valve masks, we've got to remember, do not overinflate your patient's lungs. All right? A good way to make sure that you don't overdo it is you can use a pediatric BBM on an adult. That way you can get a full squeeze in. Um, if you have an adult BBM in a small adult and you're trying to push all that volume in, you could do some serious trauma to the lungs. And I'll also interject with that. Uh, an adult BVM has about 1,500 milliliters. A pediatric has 500 milliliters of air. The average adult breathes about 450 to 650 milliliters of air. Perfect. Thank you. Let's go into some uh, supraglottic airways. We're all familiar with the King, the LMA, the Combi tube, and the newer one that I actually had to look up was called the eye gel. Eye gel is very similar to an LMA, but there's no bulb to fill. Um, and it also has a gastric channel for placement of an NG tube uh, later on. 
Uh, it's very form-fitting and they're uh, color-coded for different sizes of adults. They seat right in there, make a good seal, and they have a good air exchange. Your combi tube, uh, along with your king, they're blind insertions. Uh, your combi tube has two different tubes uh, to ventilate through. You try both of them, and whichever one's ventilating the lungs and you hear lung sounds, that's the tube you use to ventilate through. Your king airway, another dual lumen airway with a single fill port. Um, again, it's a blind insertion, um, but neither of them are very good at, at stopping aspiration along with the LMA. The LMAs are used a lot in surgery, um, but for our type of business, the definitive treatment is innovation, but this is a great way to um, get your airway and make sure the patient's getting ventilated. And I'll add to that um, also, like you said, the LMA is great for surgery because these are people who have been MPO without food or drink for 8 to 12 hours prior to surgery. Most of the time, the patients you're going to be getting have been just eating the biggest Thanksgiving dinner they can, and you're going to intubate them, and it's all coming back at you. I'll also interject on that combi tube because we have two tubes to ventilate through. Make sure you don't have the police officer assisting you ventilating the stomach the whole time so when they pull the uh, bag off when you realize they're ventilating the wrong tube at the bottom of the stairs that it doesn't shoot up like a fountain and go all over them. This may or may not have happened. <laughs> Good point. Um, let's talk a little bit about innovation. You have your Macintosh and your Miller blades. Uh, your Macintosh, remember, it's curved like an apple. In both blades, you're going to want to lift up and sweep left to right. Um, the Macintosh blade, uh, like I mentioned earlier, sits in the volecula just above the epiglottis. All right. And both of them do not rock back. Remember, you're put, pulling up towards the belly button. You're not rocking back towards the teeth. Breaking teeth is very, very bad form. Uh, your Miller blade straight. Um, it's all a matter of preference. Pediatrics, uh, I'd probably go with the Miller blades. It seems to work a lot better with the peds. Your bougie, um, hopefully all of you have an opportunity to play with it in, in lab at one time or another. If not, I'm sure you will. It's a great tool that we have in our bags to make sure that we get in the right place when we're innovating. Use it like a stylet. You can insert it down into the trachea, and with a little curved end on it, you can actually feel it bounce on the tracheal rings, which gives you another, if you can't quite see it visualized going through the cords, you can feel it bouncing on the, on the tracheal rings. Um, they have great video scopes out there now. Um, it's becoming the new standard. I know in Lucas County, Dr. Lindstrom is making people go to that first before the old school innovation. Um, it's being proven that it's increasing success rates. Um, it's an insertion. You can actually visualize the cords in a little screen that's on top of the basically the laryngoscope handle. Um, so it works out real good. It's, it takes time for us old guys to get used to it, but I think it's a great tool overall. Um, then moving on, when you have a tough airway and you can't get it, things are occluded. We're going back to the cricothyrotomy. Cricothyrotomy, I yes. can never say that. <laughs> I tell you. Um, there are a lot of prepackaged kits out there, but when you're going old school and you have your scalpel and your ET tube, I think that's the way to go. Um, basically, what you're going to be doing is you're going to be making a cut between the cricoid and the thyroid cartilage. It's going to be a vertical cut. Um, make sure you don't nick that carotid artery. All right. Once you visualize the little place that you want to go in, you make your horizontal incision, use a blunt end of your scalpel, um, and kind of twist it in the opening to make it bigger. You slide your ET tube in there, you're talking 5.5 to 6.5 ET tube. Um, and just remember, you're not going to insert it all the way down like you would if you're doing a normal oral intubation. You only have to go past the cords, so you're going down maybe a couple inches. Watch for that bulb to slide all the way down in there. Okay, and do not cut off the excess ET tube because then your bulb will not stay inflated. Okay, right, so now we're talking about assessment. So we've kind of reviewed a little bit the anatomy and the physiology, we've talked about what kind of adjuncts we have available. Let's start talking about what we're looking at and maybe what decision making thought process we want you to go through when you come into these difficult uh, airway or respiratory situations. So 
The first thing anybody's going to do when they walk in the room, I call it the look test. You're going to look at a patient and you're going to pretty much instantly know, are they sick or are they not super sick? So ideas that tell you somebody's sick. Are they cyanotic? That's a pretty clear indicator. If they look like a Smurf, there's something wrong. Are they pursed lip breathing? Are they tripoding? Or are they unresponsive? I mean, any of those pretty much tell you that there's something bad going on. We're going to take a quick listen. If they are breathing, we're going to take a quick listen. We're going to want to listen for first upper respiratory sounds. Do we hear any strider? That tells us maybe there's an area of obstruction that could be food, that could be items, that could additionally be anatomy, that could be swelling of the epiglottis or an allergic reaction. We're then going to listen to the lung sounds. And this is really going to help give you a better idea if you don't have any other history as to what might be going on with this patient. Uh, are they wheezing? Do they have those rails or those crackles, that wet lung sound, sounds almost like fluid? Or do they have ronchi, which is kind of that chronic COPD emphysema changes? And a good way to test the sound of ronchi is take hair by your ears. Unfortunately, Matt can't do this. But you take the hair by your ear and you just pinch it and rub it between your finger and it's got kind of that rough sound. And that is the sound of ronchi. And I bet every one of you is doing that right now. So... Well, those are going to give you an idea. Wheezing, do they have asthma or COPD exacerbation? If they've got the rails or the crackles, usually that means fluid. So that's either going to be your heart failure or your pneumonia patients. So next step is we're getting vital signs. We're going to be getting a pulse ox, um, something that's not considered a vital sign, but I think is pretty vital, especially with your COPD and your asthma patients would be an end tidal CO2. Now it's becoming so mainstream attached to your nasal cannula that we can hook it into our life packs and we can get a, a live reading with a good waveform. Um, so I would highly encourage everybody to be doing end titles so they can monitor their patients as well. Generally, you're going to see end title changes before you see SpO2 changes. Respiratory rate, that's pretty pretty easy one. And you can kind of look at somebody and know, are they breathing fast or are they breathing normally? Heart rate and blood pressure. So those are kind of the ones for the field that are really important. Temperature is considered a vital sign. You know, uh, in the field, I don't consider it as much of a vital sign um, because it's not going to change your management a ton. So, we, we, you know, we're getting to the point where we've got a patient that we know looks sick. We're really concerned. We're thinking we're going to need some sort of airway on them, uh, whether that be endotracheal intubation or we just kind of lumped everything as superglottic airway. Technically, some are considered extra, some are super. It really just matters where to the glottis the airway is going to seat primarily. Uh, but we lumped them all together as the term superglottic airway. So what are some benefits of an endotracheal tube? Because we all know as paramedics, the first thing we want when we're doing an airway, if we're doing an advanced airway, we want to get that tube. We want to get that gold standard as we consider it. So the benefits of the endotracheal tube is it's definitely going to help with aspiration. It is the only thing that truly seals off the trachea to prevent aspiration from getting in there. You're going to get the best ventilation and the most control over your ventilation as well as it really, in terms of burns or airway swelling, neck trauma from clothesline injuries, hangings, those kinds of things, is it's the only thing that's going to prevent that trachea from closing off due to swelling from injury, from trauma. So that's something to remember. Uh, if you get a patient who's a clothesline injury or other tracheal injury, generally you do want to attempt the endotracheal tube. But what are some of the things that come along with doing an endotracheal tube? Well, studies are showing us we have longer on scene time, so less time getting to that trauma center for those traumatic injuries. We have increased time to obtain an airway. It is a lot longer and harder to set up and actually place an ET tube and, you know, get that all set up and confirm placement in bilateral lung sounds and all that with that than it is to go ahead and just do it with a superglottic airway, which is a quick put it in and you're done. Then we also have an increased risk of aspiration. So during the procedure, people may have gag reflex, and that may cause aspiration. And we also are going to have decreased success rates and increased risk of traumatizing the airway. All right, let's talk a little about preparation for uh, intubations. Preoxygenation is so essential. If we don't do this, our patients are going to suffer. We're going to talk a little bit more about this later, but consider high flow nasal cannulas. Um, again, we're going to talk about it. There's some great research out there, um, very beneficial. How are you going to do it? Pre oxygenate your patient. Um, then you're going to look at the patient. Is it going to be a difficult airway? You can pretty much look at somebody as you walk into a room and say, oh boy, that's going to be a tough tube, or that shouldn't be too bad. So, what are we looking for? If you look inside the mouth, do they have a large tongue? Is there facial trauma? Um, 
do they have a, a big bushy beard that's going to get in your way? Do they have a lot of uh, piercings or something that's inside the mouth that's going to get in the way? There's a lot of different acronyms out there uh, to help you remember this. Uh, for BBMing, you're going to look at the acronym MOANS. All right? You're going to look and see if something's going to mess up with your mask seal. Again, the beard, is the patient disfigured? Um, o, are they obese? Or is there some kind of a obstruction going on? A, their age, the very old, the facial features start to change. Um, are they really young? Do you have the right mass to fit their age? No teeth, that's gonna uh, to affect how you do things. Are they snip, stiff? Are you gonna be able to open their airway, do a jaw thrust? Um, then when you go to innovate, you look for your acronym of LEMONS, all right? You look, look externally. Is there any bleeding going on? Do they have an extremely small mouth? Evaluate with the E, it's your 332 rule. Um, you'll learn more about that in class, but it's how, why they can open their mouth. You look down in there, do you see a good open airway? Do you see all the way back? Um, Malampati, you're gonna learn these in class two, classes one through five. Um, that's how much tonsils you can see and how basically how much does the tongue obstruct the airway is really what that's telling you. Some people they stick out their tongue and even with their saying on ah, turn out tongue I still need a tongue depressor to move it out of the way because I can't see their tonsils. That's somebody who's got a higher mountain potty class. A nice young healthy adult generally they open their mouth stick out their tongue and you can see all the way to the back of their throat. That's going to be your lower one and two and those are going to be generally easier intubations. Those are what you're always hoping for. Too. <laughs> it never happens. Yeah, exactly. All right, is there an obstruction? Okay, do they have something in there? Do they have a muffled voice that might clue you into it? Are they having a hard time swallowing the secretions? Um, and again, poor glottic views. If you're looking down there and all you're seeing is tissue, you might want to reconsider what's going on here. Neck mobility, all right? Do they have a very stiff neck? Have they had past trauma? Are they very arthritic? and the neck isn't very flexible at all. Um, and also the last one is sat saturations. So yeah, um, I think basically the thing is, what's their O2 sat going into the intubation? If their O2 sat is low going into the intubation, you're, you're gonna have much less time for your looks. You, you know, you're gonna need to bag them up in between more often. Um, and so that's just uh, something. The other S they say is situation. I mean, obviously for EMS, on the side of the ditch in the middle of the winter of a snowstorm, it's not the most ideal setting to intubate somebody. Whereas for me in the ER, obviously I get a much nicer setting. I've got plenty of people, plenty of lights. It's climate controlled. It's a lot, lot easier. Great. Uh, something else to keep in mind, vomit. You're always gonna wanna have your suction ready because these patients will vomit. And like we mentioned earlier, they probably just had a huge spaghetti dinner. So, and have a backup to your suction also. Um, BVM, uh, make sure you have it 15 liters per minute. Make sure you have the appropriate size mask. And leave the nasal cannula on too, um, and during your ET attempt. Uh, make sure you have multiple tube sizes there. If you think you're going to use a 7, make sure you have a size below and a size above. That way you can change right away. Have the... Uh, stylets in so you're not messing around. Um, have your bougie ready and have your backup airway. Um, if it's a king airway, make sure it's sized and it's sitting there just in case. Get the patient positioned. Give them the neutral, the sniffing, or the ramp position that we talked about earlier. And control your environment as much as you can. Get the most light you can. Make sure you have the most room. Um, if you're in a small bedroom in the back of a trailer, you can only do what you can do but make sure you prep and make sure you have everything that you can have in that position. And when you go to practice innovations, practice on the floor, practice under a table, practice in a corner, um, because if you practice in difficult spots when you get into a house and you have to do it, it's gonna seem easy. All right, so let's talk a little bit more about the procedure. All right, prepare your patient. Um, if you look inside your patient's mouth and they have tongue piercings or anything else in there, take them out, all right, because they're just going to get in your way. Make sure your equipment's prepared. And again, have backups for your backups. You never want just one suction because as soon as you reach for it, it's not going to be charged or something's going to break. 
make sure you have something for that. Again, multiple size tubes. Um, and as the person, if they're doing CPR on them, make sure the, the compressions aren't held for more than 10 seconds. And each look, every time you stick your rindoscope in there and you look, that constitutes as an attempt. And never do the same thing twice. If it didn't work for you when you tried it the first time, odds are it's not going to work on the second time. Um, make sure the most experienced person is doing it. Um, and two attempts maximum before going to uh, your king airways or your other rescue airways, or just go right back to your BLS airway. Okay. Once you get it to, make sure you auscultate uh, over four lung sounds and epigastrium. Um, and make sure you put the color changing ETCO2 uh, detectors on there. And also make sure you always put your inline waveform. Use both of them. You should always be continuously monitoring them. Right? Make sure you inflate the cuff appropriate um, with the appropriate mLs of air. Some tubes now are taking a lot more to fill up the tubes. Uh, I was recently on a scene where someone innovated. They put 10 cc's of air into the bulb, and we were getting sounds everywhere. Well, come to find out, the ET tube required more air in the bulb to make sure it's fully inflated. Know your equipment, okay? And make sure that you um, secure your tube. Never let go of it until you are sh sure that it's secured. Um, after you move the patient, make sure that you reassess lung sounds and it hasn't been uh, dislodged. If you're having an issue um, and you're thinking, boy, this just doesn't feel right or it gets more difficult to bag the patient or if their sats are going down, remember the mnemonic DOPE. Okay, if something's going wrong, think of this. D stands for dislodgement. Check your tube. Was it dislodged? O for obstruction, is your tube obstructed? I've seen someone tighten down the Thomas tube holder so tight that they occluded the entire tube one time. It could be as simple as that. Does your patient have a pneumothorax? You can fix that, all right? Or E, equipment failure. Did something break? If it did, get something new and continue on. All right, <clears throat> so now we've really summed up pretty much everything that a paramedic needs to know and to kind of remember that we can reasonably fit into a podcast. But one of the things that I really personally wanted to add in uh, for all paramedics students and really paramedics is what's happening today. What is the literature today? What are things that you're going to be seeing in the future um, that might help you or help you adjust to the future of practice of, of emergency medicine in the field, specifically emergency medical services? So one of the first things I want to talk about is uh, Something that we've been doing in the ER that I haven't really here get into the EMS literature, into the EMS too much, is what we call um, hyperoxygenation via high flow nasal cannula. So what we do in the ER, especially with people who we think are going to be brittle, in other words, when we pull away that BVM or pull away that CPAP or BiPAP to intubate them, we're afraid their oxygen saturation is going to drop quickly. One of the things that we will do is we will put nasal cannula and turn the regulator as high as it goes. So effectively, we're giving them about 30 liters per minute. Um, we're past the 15 liters per minute mark. You can get up to about 30 liters per minute. Uh, there was a Turkish study, and there's actually been many studies uh, through quick care journals in the U.S. Scott Weingart is one of the big proponents of this from New York University. Um, and basically what they found is that at up to 12 minutes, of no oxygenating the patient, leaving this on, the O2 sats have not dropped. So that's pretty impressive, and that allows you to get through passive oxygenation quite a bit of more time. Now, remember, you're not off-gassing carbon dioxide during that because there's no ventilation going on, but they are able to at least respire and pick up some of that oxygen so they're not getting hypoxic. This will get you a lot more time during difficult intubation. So that's something to keep in, in mind. This study that we originally looked at was from December 2017, um, was from a Turkish uh, anesthesia care journal. It was what we call prospective. What that means is it was designed for purpose. They purposely designed the study. They knew exactly what they wanted to measure. They enrolled the people they thought would best fit the measurements of the study. The, this study in particular that we have was 45 patients and they measured baseline oxygen. They measured oxygen after four minutes on high flow nasal oxygen 
at the time of laryngoscopy, so when they put the blade in the mouth, and at the time of confir confirmed intubation with an end tidal CO2. Like I said, the maximum time without a ventilation, also known as apnea, and that's why we call it apneic oxygenation, was 12 minutes. No patient's SpO2 dropped more than 3% from baseline. So again, there are many studies that show that this is beneficial. This is just one of the ones that we pulled to give you an idea on that. What are your thoughts on that, Matt? Well, something I found interesting too is they had, um, when they were doing the nasal cannula, they had it at 60 liters a minute. Mm -hmm. We right. can't produce that, but we can turn it up to what, 15 to 20, I think, are the regulators. When you get past that. 20, you're, you can get 20 to 30 generally on a regulator. Okay. So we can crank it up that far, but the research does show that this is affected. And if you just think common sense wise, it makes sense on why it would work. Right. So I, and it's something easy we all can do, and it's not going to take any more time. Um, it's not going to take any more money or anything like that but it's gonna benefit our patients just by leaving, leaving the nasal cannula in there and turning it up a little bit. So I know my next innovation is gonna be like that. Absolutely. And uh, so the next thing I want to talk about is, and this is something that I know most paramedics are not gonna be happy with. Um, and this is truly, I, I anticipate in the future, we are going to see much less intubations and much more use of those circuitic or extraglottic airways. Um, so there's been a couple of papers recently. The most recent one is called the Airways 2 trial. Um, and this uh, actually is called the effect of a strategy of supraglottic airway device versus tracheal intubation during out-of-hospital cardiac arrest on functional outcome. Um, this is from August 2018 in the Journal of American Medical Association. So that's, you know, obviously a very well-respected journal. This is, again, a prospective study. It was designed for a purpose. They knew what they were looking for. They designed the study to find the questions that they wanted. They enrolled four EMS agencies in England, of which they served 21 million citizens. Any patient 18 years or older who had a non-traumatic cardiac arrest was automatically enrolled through what they call a waiver. What that means is it's not reasonable to ask a patient who's in cardiac arrest, do you want to go through and be part of this study? In certain instances, an institutional review board, IRB, the people who approve studies, may approve waivers, which means you don't need consent to do this study. Um, so that's, that's what they did. Half of the people received um, your average traditional intubation with an endotracheal tube. Half the people were sent to what we call supraglottic airway. So in other words, they did not give them any attempts at intubation. So they weren't just testing survival. It is one thing to increase survival rates, but truly we don't wanna just make more vegetables. What we want to do is we want to make functional people again who can walk out of the hospital and live a life. Um, so they were actually checking what we call neurologically intact discharge. And that's a metric that in the past was really underrated and now is becoming much more prominent. They, um, had 9,296 total patients enrolled. So that's a pretty good end number um, over, over you know, a large area of England. 4,410 received intubation, 4,886 got supraglottic airways. There was no significant difference in 30-day neurological out outcomes. So what we're saying is in, in medicine, yeah, we like to find things that are better, but something else we do is something called non-inferiority. In other words, is this new technique at least as good as the old technique? And they said, yes, as of right now in this study, a supraglottic airway is as good in terms of neurologic intact outcomes as intubation. And so that tells us why would we go through the hassle of intubation, the chances of aspiration, why would we go through the time it takes to intubate when I could throw a supraglottic airway in about 20 seconds and be done with it and move on. Um, so that's kind of what they're getting at with this study. What are your thoughts on that, Matt? Yeah, it being an old school paramedic, I, honestly, I hate to hear this because that was one of the things I always prided myself. I know all my classmates did too, is the innovation. We practiced, we were good at it. Um, I, I think some of the issue here is uh, the paramedics coming up are practicing as much as they used to. Um, and I see the research and, and I agree with it and it's changing my mind too, but I hate to lose the whole innovation thing because that is the definitive care to stop aspiration and to ventilate the patient the best. But as, as a group and me being part of this group, if we can't perform that skill, 
effectively on a regular basis and something else comes out, then, and then I, I guess this is the direction we need to move. Yeah, looking at the studies, one thing I've noticed is I don't see us ever going away from paramedics intubating altogether. And the reason I say that is these are only medical instances. Trauma is a whole different story, like I talked about before. Any sort of neck trauma, burns, that kind of stuff, they need an endotracheal tube as soon as possible because once their airway starts to swell, you're going to have a lot more difficulty getting it. And those people are going to end up with tracheostomies, and we don't want to do that if we don't have to. Um, so, you know, that's something to keep in mind that while for medical cases, especially out of hospital cardiac arrest, I think you are going to see protocols, and there are already protocols that say superglottic airway first. Um, if you have an issue with that, you can attempt an intubation. If you think there's an obstruction, you can go ahead and take a look. Um, and uh, as medical director of community EMS, my protocols allow my paramedics to intubate, but my uh, intermediates, uh, they're allowed to do endoscopy for obstruction to try and remove obstructions, but I ask them to go to a supraglottic because they don't have as much experience or as much time with the intubations uh, as a medic would have. So that's, that's you know, and, and every medical director is going to have a different comfort level, and based on how up-to-date they are with the current literature, will change things, um, but that is definitely something that, that's coming. Um, the next study we wanted to go over was called the PART trial. This was just published in November of 2017. Um, this study is actually the full name is Effect of a Strategy of Initial Laryngeal Tube Insertion versus Endotracheal Intubation on 72-Hour Survival in Adults with Out-of-Hospital Cardiac Arrest. So this is very similar to the Airways 2 trial that we just talked about. This one does not go, um, did not initially go as far as neurological outcome as what we call a primary outcome, but it was a secondary measured outcome. And this one actually has a little bit more, um, a little bit stronger evidence than I would say than, than the Airways 2 trial yeah. for supraglottic airways. So this was also in the Journal of the American Medical Association, also known as JAMA. This is actually the best possible design study. This is a multi-center prospective. So what I mean is, again, prospective. The study was designed exactly for what we're looking for. We have protocols in place for the study to get exactly what we're looking for. We're not just looking back at old charts and trying to get what we can from them to, to make something. Additionally, this is multi-center. It was done in multiple areas, multiple areas of the country, so you're accounting for regional differences. Um, it really doesn't get any better than a multi-center prospective study. The only thing you do is add a double blind to it, but that's impossible to blind a paramedic to what type of airway they're using. Um, so this is as good as it's going to get for this type of a study. 27 EMS agencies. What they did was they divide them into 13 clusters of strategy. So in other words, 13, you know, this cluster might start with superglottic. This cluster starts with intubation. At three months, they switched them. So if you were superglottic, now your strategy is intubation. So this is accounting for um, basically what if somebody is better at intubation than somebody else? This is kind of making sure that everybody gets a chance at intubation, everybody gets a chance at superglottic airway placement. And then actually at five months, they switched back. So they had 1,499 patients who received intubation, 1,505 patients who got superglottic airways or blind insertion devices. So it's almost dead even. The primary outcome they were looking at was 72-hour survival, as the title stated. You know, how many people are still alive three days after the cardiac arrest? Well, with the um, success rate of intubation or placement of airway, superglottics had a 90.3% success rate of placement. Intubation is 51.6% in the field. That's a low number. The 72-hour survival rate was 18.3% in superglottic and 15.4% in intubation. So you know, 3% might not seem like a lot, but that's three out of every 100 people are surviving longer than people who had the intubation out of hospital. But let's talk about secondary outcomes. So secondary outcomes are things that were maybe not necessarily the exact study design, but they're things that the study was able to obtain through the, the design that they had, or things that they also wanted to look for, but they're real, you know, it's not their primary, obviously, as it says. So return of spontaneous circulation, 27.9% of supraglottic airway uh, got return of spontaneous circulation, 24.3% of people who were intubated. And, and truly, I think with what you're seeing is the hands-only CPR, um, we're finding that dead people don't need a lot of oxygen. 
what they need is to circulate the oxygen they do have. So we need to have our hands on the chest. We need to be doing effective CPR. We need to not be taking so many pauses and breaks and, and that kind of thing for airway management. And the nice thing about a supraglottic is you can place it while they're doing CPR. You don't have to stop CPR for that. And that may be part of this. Um, hospital survival to discharge, 10.8% of the supraglottic airway and 8.1% of the intubation group. And then this is the big one, favorable neurological outcomes. So similar to that previous study, you know, what is, we use something called a Rankin score, which is basically a neurological deficit score, activities of daily living, what can people do? Can they tie their shoes? Can they button their shirt? Can they eat for themselves? 7.1% of the supraglottic airway patients had a favorable outcome versus 5.0% of the intubation group. So that's a big difference. Um, you know, like I said, two out of every hundred, would you want your grandma, your mom, your dad, your brother, your sister to be that supraglottic, which they have, you know, 2% greater chance of survival with a good outcome? Or would you rather have them be the standard intubation because it's what we've always done? Um, what are your thoughts on that? Well, and like I said before, being an old school paramedic, these numbers are changing my mind. Um, it used to be innovation, innovation, innovation. And, you know, and I, I can admit that, but these numbers, I mean, if you're looking to reiterate, the success rate was 90% with, with a supraglottic and basically 50% with an ET tube. That's horrible. Right. I mean, those success rates are horrible and it proves how easy the supraglottic is. True. Okay. True. It, so it, it's it's changing my mind, and it, you know what? Numbers don't lie. And these studies are are critical to progress our profession uh, in the direction we want to go, right. using evidence based to to dictate what we do in the field. And I think this is going to segue into the next article, um, which really discusses the skill level of paramedics in different areas. And in you know these intubation rates of fifty one percent. Remember, that's going to be basically like an average. So we we're going to have agencies that are in the 20s. We're going to have agencies that are in the 80s or 90s. And this is where adequate repetition, adequate practice, adequate training is really important for a paramedic and for changing uh, those numbers. And, and I bet if all the medics had the same experience as the higher performers there, those rates would be much higher and you probably wouldn't see a difference in favorable neurological outcomes. But intubation is a skill that requires significant practice to keep your skill, not just to obtain it, but you have to keep it. Just like starting an IV, if you stop starting IVs for two or three years and you go to start an IV again, or if you only start an IV once every two, three months, you're not going to be as proficient as you are doing them every day. So the next study is called the Assessing Advanced Airway Management Performance in a National Cohort of Emergency Medical Services Agencies. This was published in uh, January 2000 and 17, 17, and this was in the journals of the uh, Annals of Emergency Medicine. So this is my uh, emergency medicine journal. This is our go-to journal. Um, so what they did was they pulled the ESO electronic medical record data, and they assessed 550 agencies with 58,000 advanced airways. This is um, basically what they call a retrospective study. So it's not the best kind because they're looking back at the data and pulling what they can from the data they have. So 401 agencies had greater than 10 procedures, whether it be supraglottic airway, RSI, regular intubation, that kind of thing. Overall, with all those things, their success rates vary between 58.2 to 99%. 56 were considered low performing or below 90.1%. 38 were considered high performing or above 94.8%. That basically what they did was they um, got standard deviations and they, they found out who was below and above the standard deviation from the mean. What that tells us is actually most agencies in the 90s um, is, uh, you know, most agencies were in the 90s. If the lower performance cutoff, the lower standard deviation was 90.1%, where does that 58.2% agency? You know, that's, that's an issue for that agency. That's something that needs to be looked at. And hopefully their medical director is following their success rates and, you know, creating some sort of implementation of education or protocol changes to help assist those uh, success rates. If they're having a lot of trouble with intubations, they may have to pull them, do supraglottic airways, maybe do more training, get cadaver time, OR time for their medics, and then if it improves, they can add it back into the protocols. Um, 342 agencies had greater than 10 intub conventional intubations. So again, this is what we're talking about, what we've been you know, training you guys to do. 
is that intubation procedure. So 342 were doing that. That also tells me maybe about 70 were just doing superglottics or they do RSI. Um, the success rates for this was 47.1% to 95.8%. 64 agencies were low performing below 70.9%. 45 were high performing above 83.6%. So again, there's more deviation than what we talked about previously. And again, if most agencies are somewhere between 70 to 83%, what about that 47% agency? What's going on there? Um, so the whole point of the study is it tells you that success rates are very different depending on the agency, the patient population, the frequency they're gonna be doing the procedure. Um, I would stand, it would stand to show that, you know, constant training practice is really gonna to lead to a higher performing agency and that you guys need to continue to practice and also agencies where they don't have a lot of procedures, more rural agencies, probably would be better off going to blind insertion devices and then just doing, you know, CPR. So that, that's kind of what that tells me. Exactly. I mean, and these numbers don't lie. Um, all these publications are out there. Um, we encourage you to look at them, read them regularly. I mean, this is your profession. This is driving what you do and you're the next generation to figure out this evidence-based uh, education and, and see where your profession is going. Um, so like Dr. Kimball said, make sure you practice, make sure you read, um, you keep up on your skills um, and follow through with everything that you're doing. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that, like, I don't think we've stressed it enough, have we? You got to yeah, practice. Right, right. You got to keep up with your skills. Once you're done with class, the learning is not over. Medicine is a lifelong learning profession. And it, it, like we, we we hit earlier, if you stop practicing, if you happen to be at an agency where you're not getting a lot of things, all right, it's just not part of what you're doing, then it's your responsibility to go out there and practice whether it's in a cadaver lab, whether it's going back to your school, you're always welcome to come back here and practice on the mannequins and work with the students. Um, we'd love for you to do that. You gotta keep your trait up. Because if you don't use it, you will lose it. Absolutely. So the last article we have, um, this one I'm actually gonna probably, uh, I think there's a few flaws with this one, so we'll talk about it though. This one was from Journal of Critical Care, 2017, July 2017. Uh, titled Systematic Review and Meta-Analysis Comparing Mortality in Pre-Hospital Tracheal Intubation to Emergency Department Intubation in Trauma Patients. So ultimately, you take trauma patients and find out if they were intubated in the field versus in the ER, which ones had a better uh, mortality rate, so which ones died, you know, less. You know, 21 studies is what they reviewed with almost 36,000 patients. That's pretty large. It was retrospective. So again, this is not the best type of study. We prefer a prospective study. The mortality rate for pre-hospital intubation is 48%. The mortality rate for ER intubation is 29%. So initially you would say, oh crap, we just shouldn't be intubating these people in the field. I mean, 50% mortality. But really what you have to look at is maybe people getting intubated in the field were just sicker. Maybe they needed intubated sooner than the ones in the ER. I can tell you there are plenty of trauma patients who come into the ER as a level two trauma because they're drunk and they fell off their motorcycle or whatever that normally would not have met criteria for intubation. They were awake, they were talking, but they're belligerent. They are not allowing us to assess them properly. They're fighting the staff. So for their safety and our safety, we decided to go ahead and sedate them, RSI them, and intubate them. They now become a level one trauma that's considered a traumatic you know, trauma intubation. And they didn't have as much injury. We did it more for safety. And so, of course, they're going to have a better outcome versus the ones you guys are doing in the field, I would counter this study with, are probably sicker. If, you know, they're already traumatic arrest or they're peri-arrest, you know, circling the drain. That's, that's what I would say with this one. There's definitely, I think, a lot of, um, a lot of uh, inhibitions to the study, a lot, a lot of difficulty saying that this is really great data. Limitations is the word I'm looking for. A lot of limitations to this study. Yeah, I agree. It's... Uh... And I'm glad to hear a physician looking at it this way and in depth and not just jump in the gun and say, ah, medic shouldn't be innovating. All right. And that's a good thing. And we've got to make sure some of the uh, ER physicians, and that's why we've got to be up on our knowledge and our skills so that all ER physicians look at paramedics and EMTs as skilled professionals also, so that they're just not, you know what, they can't handle it, we're going to take it away from them. So, Make sure you work closely with your ER physicians. Make sure they know your skills, know what you can do, 
Um, and again, I can't stress enough. Keep practicing because these numbers. Yeah, I mean, you know, initially you look at them and oh boy. And this is why we stress, you know, preparation and, and everything else that we stressed so far today and, and really reviewed everything is, the, you know, the numbers don't lie and they definitely show that higher, there are higher performing and lower performing agencies. And generally that's going to tell you that there are agencies that get more practice and agencies that get less practice. And if you're in one that gets less practice, then you need to find that practice yourself or change your practice, you know, change how you practice ultimately. Um, you know, I, I don't do a ton of subclavian central lines. I was trained as an ultrasound, and so I know how to do them. I do them only when the situation absolutely dictates, but I prefer to use the ultrasound guided, which is considered the standard of care for me now. Um, so that's just the way I change my practice based on what's going on. It'd be a lot quicker to just do subclavians on everybody because I don't need to get an ultrasound and sterile it up. But I have to do what I have to do. Right, exactly. So. Okay. Well, thank you guys for listening. I know this has been uh, a lot longer than even I think we anticipated, but yeah, it was, it's but... good information, and uh, we hope you guys will uh, check out the next one. Who knows when or what, but we'll get another one up at some point. Well, and thanks again for being here and listening. Um, if you guys have suggestions, what you would like us to hit, to cover, if you've got questions, please email either one of us with your suggestions, and we will uh, address them. Yeah. Thanks again, you guys. Thanks, everybody. Have a good one.